Welcome to this service in which we celebrate the life and work of Florence Nightingale. Not only is it 200 years since her birth, but what better time to celebrate someone who had such influence right up to the present day on our health service. She is remembered in the Nightingale hospitals and, but for the current lockdown, would have come further into the public eye in a new museum. We begin with prayer. Lord, we give you thanks for and commemorate the life of your servant, Florence Nightingale, nurse and social reformer. We remember her work as your instrument in the world, the care and comfort she brought to people in adversity. We remember her as a loyal follower of Christ and a servant to the Christian way. May her life serve as a testament of witness and may we all follow her fine example of loyalty, dedication, and service to people everywhere. Amen. Let us join together in saying the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Our first hymn this evening is, O Thou Who Camest From Above chosen partly because of its appropriate words, but also because Florence Nightingale expressed great admiration for the Wesleys, especially for John Wesley. More of that later. The hymn will be followed by a reading from scripture. Samuel was ministering to the Lord under Eli. The word of the Lord was rare in those days. Visions were not widespread. 
At that time, Eli, whose eyesight had begun to grow dim so that he could not see, was lying down in his room. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord, where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called, Samuel, Samuel. And he said, here I am, and ran to Eli, and said, here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call, lie down again. So he went and lay down. The Lord called again, Samuel. Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call, my son, lie down again. Now, Samuel did not yet know the Lord, and the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. The Lord called Samuel again a third time, and he got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord was calling the boy. Therefore Eli said to Samuel, Go lie down. If he calls you, you shall say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. Now the Lord came and stood there calling as before, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, speak for your servant is listening. It was almost exactly 200 years ago, on the 12th of May, in fact, 1820, that Florence, daughter of Edward and Francis Nightingale was born in Florence, hence the choice of name, where they were on their very much extended honeymoon back in England, in their two homes, as the family owned Lee Hurst in Derbyshire and Embley Park in Hampshire, Florence proved a precocious child, taught history, philosophy, literature by her father, and able to read French, German, Italian, Greek and Latin. Florence had been baptised in the Church of England, although some of her grandparents were Unitarian but the family attended Methodist chapels, where Florence's admiration for John Wesley grew. In our reading, we heard of God's call to Samuel, fitting also for Florence, as on the 17th of February, 1837, she felt God was calling her. Her mission was to reduce human suffering. Florence felt that call to have overwhelming importance. She had the chance of a social life. She had a suitor who wished to marry her, but she could not say yes to him. In fact, she even asked the advice of a friend, Dr. Howe, who told her that she should act on her inspiration. That inspiration led her to nursing. Now, hospitals at that time were not as at present. They were in sanitary, dirty places, and nurses drawn mostly from the poor, and they were often drunkards. No wonder then that the family was so much against Florence joining them. They did, however, eventually agree to her enrolling at the Institution of Protestant Deaconesses in Germany, initially for two weeks in 1850, then for three months a year later. In 1853, Florence broke away from the family environment and became superintendent of the Institution for Sick Gentlewomen. We could read governesses here in distressed circumstances, where in a cholera outbreak, she showed her willingness to nurse victims when other nurses fled. That same year, the Crimean War broke out and she went to serve officially as superintendent of the female nursing establishment of the English General Hospital in Turkey. They liked long titles, didn't they? 10 Roman Catholic sisters and eight Anglican sisters helped to make up the band of 38 women who went with her. As is widely known, conditions in the hospitals like at Scutari, which served for the battlegrounds, were horrific. Moldy food, filth, overcrowding, lack of medical supplies, the list goes on, and even opposition to these women who came to serve. It was here that Florence Nightingale used her ability to marshal facts and to statistics and act on them. Her stamina, her influence, to improve medical care and reduce mortality. 
The traditional view is of the Lady of the Lamp, verified by a comment from the Times. When all the medical officers have retired for the night, and silence and darkness have settled down upon those miles of prostrate sick, she may be observed alone, with a little lamp in her hand, making her solitary rounds. One piece of evidence of the personal care she gave to sick soldiers comes through this letter she sent. A letter Nightingale wrote during the Crimean War to the mother of a soldier whom she had nursed. I am very sorry to have communicated to you the illness of your poor son, Private John Cope, 95th Regiment, number 2884. He was admitted here about 10 days ago suffering from diarrhoea. He was immediately attended to by surgeons, by one of my nurses and myself. He was fed in small quantities and frequently with port wine and arrowroot. He often murmured, dear, dear mother, and tried to say many things to you, that he was well cared for and wanted for nothing, that he had no wish for anything. I sent for the chaplain who came twice, and both times he was quite sensible and prayed fervently, and said he was quite happy in mind that he could follow all that was said. He spoke little after this, and sank rapidly and died at two o'clock in the morning of the Easter Sunday, quite quietly and without pain, in the full hope of resurrection with him who rose again on that day. I remain with true sympathy for your grief, Florence Nightingale. Another, more personal example, comes from one of our own St. Peter's congregation, whose great-great-grandfather was a veterinary surgeon in the Crimea. In one of his letters home, although not mentioning Florence Nightingale by name, he wrote, the hospital at Scutari is a beautiful place, kept in the best of order. I should very much like to have been quartered there. Certainly, mortality rates fell as conditions improved. Of course, the debate continues as to whether or not all of this is due to Florence Nightingale, or if the credit should go to Mary Seacole, who also took a group of women to nurse in the Crimea. Surely there is room for both to have played a part. With the war over, Florence Nightingale returned to England and to numerous other tasks, some better known than others. The Nightingale Fund was established. And there is another St. Peter's connection. W. Kerry Morgan, a church warden at this church, was involved in fundraising. The Nightingale Fund became the means of setting up the Nightingale School of Nursing at St. Thomas's Hospital in 1860. Less well known is her general concern for the poor and her real determination to improve their lot. As she said, I believe that more moral and physical good is done by improving the dwellings of mankind than in almost any other way. And if all the money that is spent on hospitals were spent on improving the habitations of those who go to hospitals and those who go to prison, we should want neither prisons nor hospitals. She even said with a degree of humour, I sometimes wonder why we pray to be delivered from plague, pestilence and famine when all the common sewers of London run into the Thames. She made immense improvements for the poor, for those in workhouses, as well as for the military. She became a friend of Queen Victoria, and as another friend, Sir John MacNeill wrote, to you, more than to any other man or woman alive, will henceforth be due the welfare and efficiency of the British Army. I thank God that I have lived to see your success. Then there were the books, notes on hospitals, notes on nursing, and the efforts during the Franco-Prussian War, which helped to lead to the founding of the British Red Cross Aid Society. Alongside this display of courage, stamina and determination was Florence's strong Christian faith. She saw God in nature. There is nothing makes my heart thrill like the voice of birds, much more than the human voice. It is the angels calling us with their songs. She practiced the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius of Loyola. She read widely and studied the Bible. She expressed her view of God in a sermon. 
People ask if God has a plan by which everyone is to be brought to perfection. What part is left to us? Everything is left to us. It is we who have to do it. God only supplies means and inducements. Humankind is to create humanity, but each person is to help in the creation, that is, in the perfection of humankind. This is the practical application. This the practical religion of our lives. If I did not think I was working as part of a scheme of God to bring us all to perfection, I should shirk work for what I could do among so many miseries and sins. It is because it is God's plan to be completed in God's eternity that I work at all. People seem divided between the delusion God is to do it all and that God is to do nothing. She also expressed her view in her writing. To see God, to see him without eyes and hear him without ears, as we see and hear with eyes and ears, to know him, what he is doing, and be able to help him, to know his thought, his plan in its infinite purity and holiness. This is all my desire now. This is my hope for another world. She lived by the precepts in the first letter of John. Since God loved us so much, we ought to love one another. The last years of Florence Nightingale's life were taken up by this love and duty. First in supporting her dying father. Then in looking after her mother, also dying, and her sister. At this time too, she was given the Order of Merit, the first time it was awarded to a woman. On the 13th of August, 1910, Florence herself died. She leaves an unpublished note. To think his thoughts, to choose his will, to love his loves, to judge his judgment, and thus to know that he is in us, with us, is to be at home. Amen. We now have another hymn, this time throughout with all the changing scenes of life. It's something that Florence would have known in her lifetime. She possibly even sang this hymn. It's just as applicable today.
Let us pray. Lord God, as we give thanks for all those who have gone before and helped to create our health system of today, we pray for all those who work in our hospitals, care homes, research laboratories, and as carers in people's own homes. Gracious God, give skill, sympathy, and resilience to all who are caring for the sick, and your wisdom to those searching for a cure for coronavirus. Strengthen them with your spirit, that through their work many will be restored to health, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And we pray too for those who are ill, isolated or anxious. God of compassion, be close to those who are ill, afraid or in isolation. In their loneliness, be their consolation. In their anxiety, be their hope. In their darkness, be their light through him who suffered alone on the cross, but reigns with you in glory, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And a prayer for us all, familiar from our Evensong service. Lighten our darkness, we beseech thee, O Lord, and by thy great mercy defend us from all the perils and dangers of this night, for the love of thy only Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. And we conclude our service with the blessing. May the Lord bless us and watch over us. The Lord make his face to shine upon us and be gracious to us. The Lord look kindly upon us and give us peace. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit, be with us all and all whom we love, today and always. Amen.